And hello folks and welcome back to English 403-503 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, and in this uh, lecture we'll be delving into Doug Iamond's third chapter where he talks about method. So we've talked a lot about theory, some of this far out gee whiz kind of uh, big picture stuff, but when you actually want to do a study, you actually want to apply all this stuff, uh, how do you do that? <laughs> That's what this chapter is all about. And, you know, and uh, I'm going to give us a, a big range of examples, a lot of different approaches. Uh, admittedly, some of it does overlap a bit, and it can be, you know, it's not necessarily mutually exclusive, uh, these, these uh, research types and algorithms that he's talking about here. Um, but I think the big, the big takeaway here is just to think about some of the studies that are being done and maybe some that haven't even been thought of yet. Uh, and think about how you might want to enter this sphere. It's really cutting edge type of work. And you're always, uh, I'm always hearing about these things on Wired Magazine, TED Talks. You know, there's all these uh, TED Talks where they're taking all this big data. Uh, so now let me just back up a little bit and talk about that. Uh, so one of the biggest draws, I guess, to this world of the digital uh, is the fact that whereas it would take a long, long time, you really would just not have enough time. Uh, even if you committed yourself to the project of, you know, sitting down and reading every Victorian novel. You know, uh, literature classes don't try to read, don't try to cover everything, right? You basically get like a little sliver of like the top, <laughs> the greatest hits, if you will, of any particular era. And there's a whole lot of stuff that was published back then, probably 90-something percent, that just nobody ever reads anymore, just fades away. So it doesn't ever get studied, doesn't ever get looked at. Uh, yet there might be some... Uh, you know, valuable things that could be gleaned uh, if somebody would, you know, sit down and read all that and, you know, take notes and compile uh, findings and stuff. But again, there's just not enough world in, in time. But <laughs> enter the computer, uh, enter projects like Google uh, Books where they're digitizing, you know, terabytes, whatever the phrase is for huge numbers of bytes, <laughs> you know, scanning in all of these old books. Uh, not enough time to read them. Uh, but they can write programs that can run in, uh, that, that, you know, they can write these programs and algorithms that can look at all of these thousands and thousands upon thousands of books and try to find patterns, try to find, uh, you know, interesting uh, correlations, I suppose. Uh, there's, they talk in here about Franco Moretti, and I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here, but uh, one of the projects he did was exactly what I'm talking about here with these uh, Victorian novels so he had access to all of these uh, titles from thousands and thousands of these victorian novels and he did a study uh, showing that over time the titles went from being like basically whole sentences maybe two or three sentences long title <laughs> uh, and then they got smaller and smaller until basically it's you know the kind of titles we're used to today about it uh, something like eight words long max uh, so that's the kind of thing that would have been very you know, extremely, extremely tedious, you know, before computers. I mean, if you had to actually go to the library and try to find these out-of-print books and look at the titles and, you know, write them all down and, you know, count the numbers, I mean, that would have taken... <laughs> you know, basically, uh, a lot of these projects they're doing with computers, that used to be like a scholar's whole career. Uh, you know, another example is what they call the... I think they're called concordances that people used to do where you'd go through books... Uh, like the Bible, for example, and try to find every example of a certain word, and you'd write down, you know, the page that word appeared on, uh, and a little bit about the context there, uh, and that could be just your career doing that kind of uh, tedious work. Uh, of course, nowadays with these, uh, with a computer and the algorithm, I mean, that could be done in a matter of, uh, you know, minutes basically. <laughs> so you could, I guess it's bad news if you wanted that to be your career. Uh, but it's good news in the sense that we can do a whole lot more of those kinds of studies and do, and do them very quickly. Okay, so that's kind of the background. And just to uh, get, get the ball rolling, as it were, he talked a little bit about this example, which I always think is fun. This is called the Google Ingram Viewer. And basically what this does, they've, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Google has all these books that they've scanned in. I think it's all the way. Yeah, look. So from 1800 to 2019, you can get in here and, and fuss with this if you want. Say, just give me up 2000 or whatever. Maybe you just want a certain English. You know, you could you could you could fine tune this basically. Uh, but what I did, I wanted to. What this shows me is how many times it finds these words. 
uh, over time, right? So we're looking at words, new media, these are phrases, I guess, new media, digital humanities, and digital rhetoric. Uh, I wanted to see, you know, since, uh, you know, remember when Doug Island was given all those different words for digital rhetoric? <laughs> you know, let's, let's, what was the other one? Techno rhetoric. Let's try plugging that one in too. Okay, so this would let you see, you know, which of these is actually more popular? Uh, well, I see that if we look at this new media line, it looks like it's way higher, right? There's a lot more people calling, using this word new media than, uh, say, digital humanities. Digital rhetoric, you know, we basically have to remove new media. Let's get rid of that one. And see, now digital humanities is huge, so let's remove that one. Okay, so you have to remove a couple levels to get down to, like, uh, even digital rhetoric and techno rhetoric. But clearly nobody's really using this techno rhetoric <laughs> term. Uh, but anyway, this uh, Google Ingram Viewer is kind of a fun thing you can use to track a trend, a phrase that you might be interested in. You know, when did people start using that word? Uh trying to think of a good a good one to look for what was the other one techno rhetoric electricity i think was came up or electric rhetoric let's just try electricity and you can sort of trace like well not in 2000 and actually it's kind of gone up that's kind of surprising see how easy it is to get lost in this kind of thing <laughs> oh this is just a free tool go to books.google.com slash ingrams and you can play around with this and it kind of gives you a nice little introduction to the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. You know, imagine ha trying to go to all those books or all those websites or blogs or whatever it is you're studying, just counting and looking for each use of that word. I mean, that'd be extremely tedious. Uh, the computer, you know, it's just that easy. Boom, boom, there you go. There's a, a visualization and you can see the lines and you, know, you can learn a lot that way. Uh, all right, so back to uh, Iman then. Uh, he's He talks again... Uh, he starts off again with this uh, idea of what is rhetoric, and we kind of been there and done that, so I'm not going to rehash that for you. Uh, but I do like how he says that the digital rhetoric, uh, we really want to be mindful of what makes it different, I suppose. And that includes the affordance of the digital practices. So what, what can you do with a computer that would be difficult without the computer, for example? We talked about that. Uh, the way things circulate, you know, that's a huge thing just in and of itself. You know, it's so much easier just to send an email uh, than it would be to, sorry about that, <laughs> or send a text. So much easier to send a text uh, than it would be to mail a letter uh, to somebody or send a fax, you know, even. And that's not even that old technology. So you, you could think about this role. You know, a lot of people are interested in things like viral memes. I've worked with Dr. Hyman on some projects around memes. You know, that, that's a, an example of something that, you know, you really, how could you even have that? I remember back in high school, people might write a funny cartoon or maybe clip, <laughs> you know, might pass an article around, like a comic article or something like that, or just write a funny joke on a piece of paper and, you know, might pass that around the class. I mean, that's about as close as we got to like a meme. <laughs> you know, of course, nowadays they're all over the place and that's kind of a fun thing. You know, it's fun, but on the other hand, you might start thinking, hmm, well, what are the, you know, what kind of impact might this sort of thing be having on literacy or uh, you know what are the implications here uh, we talk about uh, i've written papers too about fake news you know just any old garbage somebody cooks up <laughs> they could stick it online and make it look you know authentic and next thing you know that thing's got like thousands and thousands and thousands of people sharing that information and people actually believing it maybe even uh you know that could actually have a, an impact uh, interaction we talked about, so the, the fact that people can do more than just read these things, right? They can comment on it, reply, like it, so on and so forth. Now, what else does he have here? Uh, engagement of multiple symbol systems within rhetorical objects. Uh, multiple symbol systems. So I guess that's everything from the visuals to the, uh, uh, maybe there's a sound element, sound and vision element, uh, maybe even an animation. It's methods, you know, I don't, you know, the anim, the uh, 3D animations is something that's still, it's been around for a long time in the world of games, but uh, they're just recently uh, making these tools for 3D graphics 
uh, and 3D uh, scanning and analysis to the point where just an ordinary person <laughs> like yours truly can use it. Uh, there's a tool called Unity, and it's a little bit overwhelming, uh, but it's not that hard. You know, again, if you if you wanted to figure this out, you could you could create a uh, like a scene with a Unity. It's basically like a like a first person shooter style game, but without the guns and stuff. <laughs> you, know, you just create a scene. Maybe you want to recreate St. Cloud State. There's another one called Unreal that will let you do this. Uh, and without too much trouble, you could have a, you know, create a camera in there so you could be navigating through this 3D space. Uh, you know, and what, what are the implications of something like that? You know, I think we're just now starting to see, uh, and the tools are getting easier and easier, and, you know, kids are making <laughs> things in Minecraft. <laughs> Uh, you know, stuff like that could have a rhetorical component to it. You know, maybe you're a politician running for office. Uh, maybe you want to make a 3D world that would show like a before and after. Like here's the, you know, here's St. Cloud before, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, have the player uh, or user, I guess, uh, not be navigating through that city map. Uh, and then say, here's what, you know, would look like after, you know, we implement these policies. And boom, you know, it looks a lot better. And just to give you a you know quick real life example of this, there's an artist here named uh, Bill. God, what's his last name? I always just call him Bill. Blanking on the guy's name. Uh, but anyway, he's an artist here, and he did a study looking at the river, and I think maybe the rivers and lakes and ponds here in the, this region. I don't know if it was limited to Saint Cloud or not. Uh, Gorsica, that's his name, Bill Gorsica. So he created this thing where you, you get in this canoe and you're paddling the canoe, but in front of you is a screen, a projection. And it's he used, I think, I'm pretty sure he did use Unity for this. So it looks like you're sort of in under the water <laughs> in the rivers. <laughs> and like you could turn on these filters to make to make it so you could see the pollution, I guess see the invasive species and things. And that kind of, I guess the idea there was to kind of give you this really uh, visceral impact of like, the effects that these uh, things are having on the environment, right? You, you sort of feel like you're right there in the midst of all this pollution. Uh, that sort of has a impact on you uh, that you might not get just from reading about it, right? Or, or read or watching a television show. You know, something about being kind of immersed in that uh, seemed to make a big difference, at least <laughs> uh, to those who tried it. Uh, but anyway, back here to uh, uh, to Iman. Now, one of the things he talks about here is, let me close this out, and that one is a close reading versus distant reading. And really, he, he brings up the close reading so he can tell you what the distant reading is. But, you know, distant reading won't make much sense to you if you don't know what uh, the opposite of that is. And if you've ever taken a literature class, uh, probably maybe even in high school, they might be using these methods still. I mean, it's pretty much the preferred method. Uh, but the idea is you want students studying literature. You know, you're reading uh, Red Badge of Courage or, or uh, you know, Moby Dick or whatever the case may be. Uh, and what you want is, or at least the people that adhere to this close reading idea, uh, what they want you to do is just, you know, sit down and read the damn book. <laughs> read the poem. <laughs> Don't jump on Wikipedia uh, don't read, you know, what other people have said about the poem. Uh, you know, just yourself, you know, sit down and read this and, and really pay attention to, like, the focus or the, the structure of the poem, the uh, the word choices, the, the symbolism, um, you know, the rhythm of it. You know, so you're really kind of studying it closely, kind of like an artifact. And the idea is you can, you can learn a lot of things that way. And that's a preferred way, you know, just really looking at it closely, being very mindful of it, focusing on it. Uh, that will reveal things to you. And then you could argue about, you know, what does this poem mean? Uh, well, let's look very carefully at, you know, this line here of the poem. <laughs> uh, so what you're not what you're not looking at doesn't matter what the author of the poem said. Uh, the poet says, hey, this you're, you guys are wrong. I wrote the poem. It means this. Nobody cares. <laughs> like we're not even going to listen to you. Uh, we don't care what the author says. You know, we just want to look at you know what the uh, the text that's in front of us. We're going to ignore everything else, and just uh, you know zero in on what's actually in front of us. And you know, that's what this uh, close reading 
method is all about, and I think they call it new criticism. So the, you know, this was a kind of revolutionary thing, and that was a response to this earlier method where you did, you know, you look very carefully at the history of the poem. Uh, you wanted to know what the, what did that word mean back then? You know, what was the original context? You know, you studied like the author, uh, to try to figure out what this author might have meant in this poem. <laughs> Uh, but this new criticism kind of abolished all that. Uh, and it's still kind of practiced today. You know, I have uh, I remember taking lots of literature classes, and at least when I was in college, and the professors would actually say, don't read anything but the but the novel. You know, don't don't read any reviews. Don't don't look at those cliffs notes for God's sake. <laughs> Is that even still a thing? Uh, but they really wanted you to sit down and study it. Because uh, it's almost like the idea that these works of literature it's like they're almost uh immortal or like eternal works of art so it doesn't really matter that it was written a hundred years ago in a different time and, and space it still has this value intrinsic value uh, that you can only get if you closely read it very 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 mindfully uh, at least that's my my take on this not i'm not dismissing it i think it's uh you know i i, I, I like it myself <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of nice not to have to worry about what all these critics over the centuries have said about something uh, and just being able to read the, the poem or the dialogue or whatever. Uh, okay, so that is the close reading, and he says that that method does have some use uh, for digital rhetoric, whether you're talking about something that he calls born digital or digital native. Uh, what that means is uh, if it's born digital, that means it's something like a website or a video game, you know, something that was uh, created on a computer or on a device and it's intended to be accessed on that device. Uh, not like a, you know, like you could take a book here and, and scan it like Google does, and, you know, make a PDF out of this book. And that's not what he, that's not a born digital thing. That's a born print, I guess. You know, so this is kind of like a, an old fashioned thing that you sort of, uh, recreate online, if you will. Uh, so that's the opposite. Uh, what he's talking about here is, again, something that was created on a computer, never was a print artifact. Uh, and those, those, uh, you know, people go back, you know, there's, there's some people that want to use the computer to study the old stuff. You know, they, they, they'd be quite happy <laughs> uh, just using the computers to, to study those Victorian novels. Uh, uh, whereas other people would like to say, well, yeah, that's fine, but let's use these methods and apply them to, to newer things like, uh, I don't know, uh, e-books or, or websites or, or, or uh, MOOCs, you know, MUDs, that, that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so we know what close reading is now. The distant reading, um, you know, in some ways this is like the opposite of that. And Franco Moretti, his name comes up all the time, uh, even though he's kind of a... Uh, a controversial figure these days uh, for various reasons. Uh, I won't really get in, into that here, but uh, he kind of uh, pioneered this method, I suppose, where you, again, use the computers to look at these huge corpus, this huge corpus of books or data. Uh, you can learn a lot. I already mentioned his uh, study on titles, but he's done all sorts of graphs. He's got a book called Graphs, Maps, and Trees, uh, where you can see... Uh, what they call it, distant reading visualization. So I thought I would just show you a quick example of what they're talking about there. Oh, uh, so one one of the tools is called Word Clouds, <clears throat> and what you can do with a Word Cloud. So I have this article that, you know, it's got a this kind of a rough draft we're working on uh, with our Conlanger group. You can see it's about 28 pages or so. Now, if I was close reading this, you know, you'd start, you know what it means, right? You'd word by word, very carefully going through it. But the word cloud is a distant reading method. So I don't even have to read this article to do the word cloud. I don't even have to know anything about this. I just tell it, I go to the word cloud, and you can download this as an add-on for Google Docs. It's just called word cloud. I guess there's a premium version. I'm not sure what, what that means, but... Anyway, you can install this and then run it on your document. And what it does, I don't know how, this might be a little hard for you to see. Let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, so it goes through the document and it looks at the words and it tries to figure out what words are used 
most often or frequent uh, frequency. So that it says their frequency is 104 times. It's 5.2% uh, of the total. That's the word language. And then we got words like belter and belters. So kind of like the in-gram viewer, we can go in here and tweak this and say belter and belters is the same. <laughs> you know, count that as just one item. Uh, but the bigger the word, you know, the more times it's used, right? And you can, you can kind of play around with this. I don't know what happens if we click on these. Can you click on multiple? Update. Let's see what that does. Updating. Is that getting rid of a word? We might have to upgrade to get some of these uh, features, but usually there's a way like take words out. Uh, but anyway, why, why would you want to do something like this? Uh, well, one thing it can give you a sense of is like, what, where are the priorities? You know, what is this article? Uh, you know, what are we most concerned with? <laughs> you could use it in a writing instruction point of view. You know, maybe you're trying to increase your vocabulary or something like that. And you see, wow, I've really used just the, those one or two words a lot. You know, maybe I need to find some synonyms, you know, so we don't, you keep using the same uh, two or three words over and over again. You know, you could do things like that. Um, you, know, you could try to find a sort of bigger picture views of things. You know, one of the things I like to do with this, uh, I don't have it set up now, but if you go to, say, the uh, GOP, you know, Grand Old Party, or like the Republican Party website into a word cloud generator, and you can compare that to the you, know, you could do the same thing over on the, the Democrat side, and that's kind of re revealing. You know, you can get a sense of like where the you know what's important to these two parties, you know, what is the where are the emphasis, what are the big words in the word clouds when you do that. Uh, that can be very revealing. Uh, but again, the nice thing about this is you don't actually have to sit down and read anything. You just plug it into the computer, say, hey, do the word cloud, <laughs> do the graph, do the map, <laughs> and boom, there you go. Uh, some useful data. Uh, that you can use in various ways. Uh, he also talks about, you know, writing studies here, so zeroing in on composition. And this is really where I think we're just, just beginning to scratch the surface of this. You know, this is the million dollar project. I mean, this, this is the, this is the, the gold mine. <laughs> this is the, you know, you could really hit a jackpot here uh, if you really got uh, something going with the, uh, uh, using these techniques with writing studies. You know, so, so basically, how, to, how can you help students in an English 191 or similar class? You know, they, they're all trying to learn how to write. Uh, you know, how can you use computers? How can you leverage this type of uh, uh, these, these methods to help them improve? And there's been you know, some limited work. You know, some of the more interesting ones that I'm familiar with, there's a lot of efforts to uh, provide uh, guidance to writers, so they might run a study, and they might run some algorithms to tell you, for example, uh, this is plagiarized. There's a site called Turnitin.com, <laughs> so, so it has this corpus, and it looks at the student's essay, and it tries to look for passages that are uh, copied or too similar uh, to something already in the database, and then it will say, you know, look, if you, you know, 30 percent of this document is composed of these uh, existing documents, you, you might want to, <laughs> you know, change that up a little bit, get it, uh, change some of the words, or, you know, make sure you're citing things properly. Uh, so that's one example of this kind of thing. Uh, the collaborative activity, I have an example of that to show you. Uh, so again, if we go to this word cloud, I mean, if I go to the uh, Google Docs, I can look at the version history. Yeah, see the version history. Well, this one is just me. Let me find one that's uh, let me find one that's actually been collaborated. Okay, here's one that we've been collaborating on. So I can say vision version history. See version history. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so this is a way to get some visualizations of who has done what. Uh, so if you a lot of times, especially if you're trying to teach. Uh, group writing or collaborative writing or if you're doing it yourself there, there's this kind of feeling sometimes you get of uh, you know i think this is inevitable for any group project right but you know, was, uh, you know somebody says you know i did the majority of the work or this person's uh, didn't contribute much or you know that sort of thing uh, or you might be wanting to do studies of uh you know anything from you know race and gender kinds of issues 
you know, maybe you want to compare, uh, you know, the people in a group and, and who contributed and how did they contribute, when even. But you can see there's actually quite a bit of data uh, that you could harness just from this little page here. Let's see the purple there. It's Kish, that's Kyoko. There's me, orange. Who's green? Sharon. <laughs> As you can see, like, who did the outline? And There's a lot of different colors in here, but man, that's, that's the basic idea. And I think this will even let you, yeah. So you can, like, look at the documents over time. That's each edit. You can go back to, like, an early version. So, again, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine... You know, doing what I'm doing here, just clicking between different versions. If you didn't have a computer and you just were working with uh, paper documents, you'd have to sit there and read them very carefully side by side and try to spot, you know, what's the differences. <laughs> you know, that would be a very super tedious project. Uh, whereas with this, you know, it's just a click and you can see who added what and you can go, you know, right to the change they made. Uh, so it's pretty powerful. It's, it could give you a lot of insight. Uh, into this composition process, you know, you, you could watch over time. You know, you know I could imagine us having a Zoom like session where you're sharing the screen and you're, you've got it recording. Uh, the student uh, working with Google Docs, you know, typing in the document. You could you could zero in on a particular moment in the document. Uh, you could really get some insight. Maybe they uh, are stuck at maybe they spend like two hours trying to work on the introduction, <laughs> you know, and end up deleting it, you know, at some point. Uh, you know, just stuff that's kind of hidden, right? But but with the, the you know the computer and these these new methods, we could zero in on that. You know, and the reason I said it's so it's a groundbreaking thing. You know, we're still used to this idea of uh, people reading these essays. You know, even here at Saint Cloud State, we do all these assessment programs, assessment projects. We're trying to figure out basically, uh, you know, are we helping students become better writers? And usually, the only way you can go about that study is to say, let's get two or three of us in a room with you know, a couple hundred essays, and you can really only either briefly read a lot or maybe uh, just pick a few at random to read. Uh, but you really don't have that big of a sample, right? And you're trying to make these conclusions. And you know, again, there's only so, even if you are like the most diligent person ever, uh, you're not going to sit down and read a thousand of these essays and have anything meaningful to say about them. Uh, in a week or two weeks or however long you're, you're given. Uh, but again, if you could create some kind of algorithm to quickly go in there and see, you know, what could the computers tell you? Maybe you could get some insight into, uh, maybe you're trying to study like revision. Uh, so you could have, a th say, 10,000 student essays, and here's 10,000 rough drafts, and, the, you know, you get the figures for how long they are and, and so on and so forth. And then the final versions, you could see, Things like how how much do they, you know, like word count would be an easy thing to find, uh, number of paragraphs, uh, you know, basically anything that the computer could find out for you, <laughs> uh, you know, versus you know the distant reading, uh, that would be very useful, and it would be available. Whereas trying to do close readings, you know, give me a break, you never. Uh, you know, just reading like the first, <laughs> just reading the titles <laughs> of all those essays would take you forever. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot to be learned here, and I think we're just on the, uh, you know, just in the early stages of it. Usability studies I talked about here a little bit. Uh, this is another uh, method. I guess they call it digital methods, digital rhetoric methods. It, it's used a lot in... Uh, interfaces and websites, web designs. Uh, it kind of goes, uh, to me, hand in hand with accessibility. You know, thinking about people that maybe they uh, can't see. Uh, so they're accessing uh, a website with a reader program, you know, things of that sort. So you, there's a lot of uh, interest, of course, and uh, you want to make these sites uh, universally accessible to everybody. Um, but usability could also be things like ergonomics or comfort. We used it quite a bit with the St. Cloud State uh, English Department website. Uh, so the idea is you give a student, or you know, maybe you're doing a usability test, right? So you have some, uh, some participants come in and you say, look, I got a few tasks I want you to do on this website. I'm going to sit here and just watch you do it. 
I'm not going to interfere with you. Uh, I just want to see uh, how hard it is or how easy it is for you to do this these tasks, right? Now, one of the tasks might be to find a find out what classes are available uh, in the spring. You know, some, some, that could be the task, right? And then you watch, uh, you know, the person see where they click. <laughs> you know, do they go to the right place right away? Uh, or maybe they spend a long time and, and they go to a lot of the wrong places before they ever figure out how to do the uh, uh, the search. So this usability report, you could use that to say, look, we need to do something because, you know, the students are really struggled with this task here. You know, maybe we could make the button for the uh, class schedules bigger or more prominent or, you know, something uh, that would make that easier uh, to do, uh, easier to use, usability. <laughs> How usable is the site? <laughs> and, of course, nowadays, again, with, with Zoom, and it's so easy to record a screen, you know, you don't even have to be standing there with the person. Uh, you could just have them uh, record, you know, basically record the screen for a while as you're playing the game or... Uh, trying to figure out the interface uh, and then you could run those algorithms again and try to figure out okay task one took you know we did this we had a hundred people do this study we found that uh, you know five percent of them took 10 minutes to do this uh, 95 percent of them uh, it only took 30 seconds uh, so you don't even have to look at those results you just have the <laughs> the statistic the percentage <laughs> good to go you know you move on to the next task uh, so you know, think about the implications of all this for uh, education. Let's see what else we have here. D visualizing discrete elements in the writing process that it takes place between and among multiple authors. We saw that. Computer-generated, uh, computer-based text production practices. The interactions of people who use digital technologies to communicate. You know, this is uh, a... You don't really hear about MUDs too much anymore. Moos. Uh, those were, I think I mentioned those before. Uh, St. Cloud State was kind of on the cutting edge of that uh, back in the, I guess, probably the 80s and 90s. Uh, but these were online worlds like World of Warcraft. Uh, but everything was just text-based. Everybody was just communicating with uh, text. Uh, so some of the professors here were using that to teach people English, you know, amongst other things. Uh, and they would set up like rooms and situations so that they could uh, practice things. <laughs> you know, like how do you order <laughs> how do you order a meal at a restaurant? You, know, you could sort of simulate that uh, on these on these muds. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but that's the sort of thing there where you could uh, you, you could adapt a method like that to study writing uh, in any context. Chapters in digital writing research show us the definition of writing has changed and in the digital age, and that consequently, our approaches to doing research need to change. We need a parallel and equally dramatic change in our notions of methodology. All right, I mean, I'm constantly confronted with this. <laughs> you know, the type of uh, writing that students tend to do in a lot of English classes is not really very representative of the writing anywhere else. And <laughs> you know, you know, where else in life are you going to sit down by yourself and, like, write this essay and, and submit that you know, again, all yourself, nobody else helping you with it, no, and just only one person reads it, the teacher. <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's fine. It's an educational context. You kind of expect uh, that sort of thing, but, uh, you know, the reason, of course, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's consider these other things, like the, you know, if you wanted to have a group project and you wanted to have, a, you know, in any kind of business scenario, if you're writing a business plan, for example, it's not just you in a room writing this. Plan. I mean, you, you got all these people and different levels of the company you know, writing different parts of it, and you've got different layers of management. I mean, it's a very complex uh, endeavor. Uh, but to try to simulate something like that in a classroom, and uh, that can be very, very hard, especially if you're trying to uh, grade it. <laughs> like, like, how do I know who did what on this? And uh, if you didn't have these tools that we were, you know, like this, you know, with this. Uh, this tool here we could go in and look at like the different colors and see what you know what student added what and, and so on and so forth you could sort of get a better view of it uh, but i think that's kind of where we need to head you know we need to get better at that sort of thing uh just because the you know, all the stuff is changing so fast i don't know if we want to be using you know methods that were developed back in the 
you know, 1800s, or even back in, uh, you know, ancient Greek and Roman times. You know, maybe we should rethink some of these things. Uh, let's see what else is in this chapter. Anything that um, we need to know? Yeah, network analysis. I'm going to show you some of this stuff here. Yeah, we talked about this. This is one of the tools they're talking about. Uh, uh, flow charts and social networks, or social network analysis. So you could take that literally. If you want to trace things like memes, you could use software to find out uh, basically who's posting it and how's it, how's it circulating throughout the globe. <laughs> it's pretty fascinating to look at those sorts of things. Again, there's a lot of TED Talks on, on this sort of stuff. Uh, but just to show you a quick and dirty example of this, uh, you know, this is a tool, it's free, or at least this sort of stripped down version is free. What is it called here? Um, go away. You know, I don't actually see the name of this product anywhere. That's kind of a, <laughs> talk about usability. <laughs> Let's see, maybe we, I don't want to watch a video. Let's see, can I get the name of the program? Lucid! Thank you. <laughs> okay. There's a program called Lucid uh, that you can uh, add on to your Google uh, Docs. And what it lets you do here, you can make these flow charts. Yeah, decision. Write the rough draft. Just making stuff up. You, can, you see how it's working, though, right? You make these different kinds of boxes. Uh, and then you can work out with, uh, yeah, this would be like if, uh, I guess you're writing some instructions, so you could say, are you are you struggling with the rough draft? Yes, <laughs> go to this part. Uh, no, then go over here, skip a step, you know, go to the next thing. Uh, I actually saw something like this used on the tax forms. Uh, they will say things like, if you, you know, if you, ha if you made this amount of money, uh, skip to, you know, step C, step D or whatever. Uh, they might use a product like this. And, of course, with programming or an interface, you would start with something like this. You wouldn't sit there and try to program buttons and things uh, before you had the plan. <laughs> uh, so you use a program like this to diagram it out, uh, and then you could uh, start making your program, you know, once you were satisfied with this. It's a lot easier to change this stuff, you know, at this stage than it would be later on when, once everything is coded in and the artists have come in and made everything look nice <laughs> you know that is not when you want to start taking away buttons and rearranging menus uh, okay then they've got um uh let's see what do they talk about there uh who is so this is a good way to find sometimes you find a website you're not sure if it's legit or not uh, so you can use this i can look up and just type in a uh URL, stcloudstate.edu, for example. You could say, I looked that up. What did I have missed there? Must have missed something. How did I spell it wrong? I don't know what's, let's try the who is. I, <laughs> I know this one uh, works. Who is dot net. Yeah, stcloudstate.edu. Search. We don't offer any. All right, what am I... Hang on. Okay, I don't know what was going on with those other sites, but I finally found whois.domaintools.com. Okay. And this one works as expected. So what you do with this, you type in a domain, a URL, and it will tell you some information about uh, who owns that. So I typed in stcloudstate.edu and it tells me, it tells me that the registrant organization is St. Cloud State University. Okay, so that checks out. <laughs> and then you can see who the tech contact is, Tony Sorterberg, and you know other types of information. I don't know if it's going to have the. Uh... There's a way to do this. Let me just show you this real quick. Okay, so this is. Uh, the command prompt and to get to this I think it's command key R and then just type in uh, command I'm not sure what it is on, on a Mac but but anyway you, you know you could figure out if it interests you uh, but what you can do with this well there's lots of stuff you can do with it but uh, 
you could try to figure out how how do you get from where you are on the web, you know, in your uh, you know internet connection, uh, to the website you're trying to access. So if I went to stcloudstate.edu with this, uh, this will trace the route uh, for me to St. Cloud State, and it says it's going to have a maximum of 30 hops. You know, so this, this I think the the cool thing about this for me is you don't realize how many different nodes sometimes uh, uh, that you're jumping through, <laughs> or like the circuitousness of the route uh, from point A to point B. And I mean, this is you know St. Cloud State. .edu. So look at how many of these places it has to stop, you know, to get there. And of course, I guess it went to Minneapolis, Charter.com. Where are we? Request timed out, so it, I guess I had to find another place. <laughs> Northernlights.gigapop.net. So it's just more fun than anything to play around with this. But uh, you know, sometimes it can be. Uh, very useful. Let me get my uh, page back up here. There we go. Uh, okay, another one they talked about was the uh, Internet Archive, archive.org. And this one is, is really cool because it, it, it's kind of a way to go back in time. Uh, so you can look at pages, what they looked like a long time ago. So again, let's try stcloudstate.edu. And this is just web.archive.org. And it gives me this graph, and I can see that it goes back, looks like 1998. Wow. So they don't have anything recorded from 96 or 97. We've got to go to 98. And we can get a look at what St. Cloud State's website looked like on February 13th, 1998. Click this. There you go. <laughs> Created January 97 for St. Cloud State. Isn't that fun? Let's see, I wonder if any of this will work. Let's see. Student life. Sometimes these will work. Yeah, I guess it still works. So they don't, sometimes they'll have the picture, sometimes they won't. But to me, this is really great, and it's another, this is useful also when you're doing a research. You might come across an article that sounds like, hey, that sounds like something I should read. You have the URL. You try to go to the URL, though, and it's no longer available. Maybe it's moved. Maybe it's changed. Uh, with this tool, though, you can go back and look, you know, at all these different periods and see what it looked like over time. You know, and again, with a computer, you could... You know, establish an algorithm to tell you all kinds of data, you know, all kinds of comparison data between those versions, you know, over time. Maybe you want to track how many links, <laughs> you know, how many links did that 1998 version have, or how many graphics were on that page, or, or whatever the case may be compared to, the, to uh, today. You, know, you could do that kind of study and have build a program uh, that would go through each, you know, version and collect all that data and, and spit it out for you in a matter of minutes. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, that sounds cool, but I'm not a programmer, you know. I mean, for one thing, it's not that hard to learn the stuff. These programming stuff I'm, I'm telling you about is pretty basic stuff. It's, you know, you could sit down with a book, <laughs> an old-fashioned book if you like, to watch some uh, videos on it and uh, get it pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, that said, we do have an excellent uh, lab here on campus. Let me get the uh, link for you. It's called the Visual Lab or Studio. I don't remember which one. And it's run by Mark Gill. Oh, come on. All right, once again, let me pause for one second. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's harder to find than I thought. It's SESU Visualization Lab. And you can go to the you can go to them. And they can help you, uh, you know, with all these different projects you might have in mind. So maybe you got this idea that you would like to do something like an Oculus Rift here. You know, it's kind of virtual reality. Uh, do something with Connect. Uh, I've had students that wanted to do things. One of the more interesting projects was the I had a student who wanted to do her thesis about magazine covers, and she wanted to look at uh, 
I think it was Men's Health Magazine and Women's Health Magazine. And she wanted to do this study to try to figure out what words uh, were on the covers, right? And, you know, was it words like, did the men's health, were the words on that cover different than the ones on the women's health? You know, what kind of uh, words? And then maybe make some word clouds based on that. Uh, I've seen studies done on things like uh, skin tones. You know, and again, looking at thousands and thousands of magazines over time, magazine covers to try to figure out, you know, what are the, how does this break down in terms of these uh, skin tone colors, uh, that sort of thing. You know, you could do that. Computers can do anything that's repetitive like that that would take forever and be really tedious. You know, the computers can just do it like that. Uh, and this Vish Studio, you know, the whole point of this, you know, is, is for students to come in that are doing research and they, they need a little help with the scanning or the printing. They also have 3D printers over there. Uh, or you say, look, I, I, you know, I know I need to write some kind of algorithm to do this kind of scanning or searching or whatever. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, they got people there that will work with you, you know, and either teach you how to do it or maybe even do it for you, depending on, you know, how trivial it would be. <laughs> a lot of the stuff, <laughs> in a lot of this stuff, it sounds like it'd be really hard. Uh, but the people that have been doing it, you know, know what they're doing. It might just be, oh, yeah, I could do that in an afternoon. You know. <laughs> Bada boom. Uh, now, here's another example of uh, this type of project. So this is a Wikipedia page. Uh, this is about, uh, this is a page about digital rhetoric. And what a lot of people don't know about, they just read the article. Uh, but there's a tab up here called Talk. And if you click on that, uh, then you can get sort of behind the scenes and you can see what people have been talking about. You know, it's, most of these are time stamped. So you get an idea of, you know, what, what, you know, what has gone on behind the scenes. You know, you could see, you could make a pretty good case. This is a sort of digital rhetoric uh, in action, right? Because these editors are tr basically trying to decide amongst themselves, trying to come to a consensus about what is digital rhetoric. You know, you know what should be on this page, what should not be on this page. Uh, but we can also, like with Google Docs, click on the view history. And now we get some more like numerical kind of data and we can compare versions. Let's say, let's look at these two. Compare those versions. And you can get, this is kind of getting a little bit hard to read, but you, you can sort of see some of the changes that have been made. And so that could be, that could lead to some insights. And then we could also look at the page statistics. Now we're really getting into some stuff. Let's see, major edits. <clears throat> so in other words, was it just like a fixing a spelling error or a broken link uh, versus like major rewrites? Uh, we can see these people that worked on it. Maybe look on their pages, learn a little bit more about who they are. There's probably some, uh, you know, I'm sure there must be some geographical data here somewhere, right, for the you know, what countries these folks are from. You know, we, we, I have to dive in a little bit deeper right, to find that, but I'm sure we could. General statistics. Top editors. Let's look at that. Okay, so that's just bopping there. But anyway, I'm pretty sure that there would be a way we could get that sort of geographical uh, data if we want. Uh, the server logs, well, let me just talk about this while I'm at this page. Uh, so one of the ways you can tell whether an article <clears throat> is relevant or not, or important or significant or not, is to see how many people have cited it. So, you know, in academics, uh, you read an essay, you want to use some of that essay in your essay, so you, you're supposed to cite the source. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise it's plagiarism, right? Uh, but you could also use, you can also look for, articles and see, uh, you know, how many times has this article been cited by other scholars? And if it's been cited a whole bunch of times, you know, that's probably a, a decent clue that it's, uh, you know, had some impact. And if I click on that button, then I can look at the, uh, you know, all these articles that cited the previous article. And then you can see how many times they've been cited, you know, and you can already get the idea of how this data <laughs> is building up. Uh, so you've got 
you know, if you visualized all this, put this into one of those data visualizations, you can make that sort of node framework and really get a sense of, wow, you know, how this has been cited in all these different places. And <clears throat> you go one step further, <coughs> start looking, typing these in, 209 there, 132 there. Uh, and maybe some of these sources are citing each other. Um, maybe some of them are sort of going further out into different areas. <laughs> So that's, again, a big picture, sort of big mi data mining type project. Uh, I'm not going to sit down and read 299 articles. Okay. Uh, but we could use these methods to figure out, well, maybe that we could find out that the article has been cited a whole bunch of times over in this country. And that could be interesting uh, data just in and of itself without actually having to read the, uh, the article. And then from there, you'd be wondering, like, well, why was it, why did they get so much attention in that country, right? You can, you can learn things that way. Okay, I think that'll just about do it. Uh, let's see, do I have anything else here I wanted to show you? Yeah, this is just a, an example of some of the different types of charts that are available. Looked at that, looked at that, looked at that. Oh, here's uh, some of the server statistics they were talking about, so... Uh, the WordPress does have this. You can use the Google Analytics uh, for that, but I just wanted to show you the, <laughs> they had this handy. Uh, so YouTube, if you post videos on YouTube, there is a option to look at the analytics. Uh, so what that is, you can look at things like, uh, you know, I guess which of the videos, how many views they're getting, how long people are watching them. So it looks like average view total, 13 minutes. Uh, impressions click through rate uh, there's one I like to look at the most is the uh, traffic source and so you can use this to try to figure out let me uh, look at an individual video I think that'll work yeah so this will let me know if people are citing it or linking to it from other places and you can see some of the websites that where people might be uh, you know, linking to your uh, video. And this is great for blogs, too. The one for the Google, you can get the same stuff for blogs. And it's really nice because you can figure out whether some other blog is uh, talking about your blog. <laughs> and then you can go and visit them uh, and see what, what it's all about. And maybe, you know, try to reach out to them if you know, they're saying good things about you. Okay, so I think that will probably do it. And if this is uh, something that's interesting for you, I would really recommend that you go check out this uh, this Viz Lab. You'll see the type of stuff they're doing over there. And they just got some fantastic stuff. Yeah, there's a picture of uh, Mark. You know, maybe you want to be the next uh, Bill Gorsica. <laughs> Make your canoe uh, project. They can, they can scan things over there. You, know, you can actually just, with your phone... You know, you can make these 3D models with your phone. Just, you know, you take, he, he'll tell you, like, how to take the pictures, and then he can put it into the program, and, you know, next thing you know, you have, like, a 3D printout of it. Uh, it's just kind of fascinating stuff. But but anyway, I feel like I've gone on long enough about this. <laughs> uh, we could I could talk about it forever, but, you know, time is limited. Uh, so I'll stop it here. If you do have uh, questions or comments, love to read those, and I'll see you next time.